very much. Dignities on the dais, ladies and gentlemen, it's really a privilege to be standing here and uh, speaking on a topic. In the book or schedule, the topic is different. It's a smart utility database, a prerequisite for smart cities. But when I was working on this presentation, I, I realized that it's not only utility database we are talking about. There is much more underground in the cities than just utilities. So I took the liberty of changing it to a smart subsurface investigation tool by smart cities. Before I, I start the presentation, I request uh, uh, just give me a signal five minutes before my time ends so that I can wrap it up. Right? I have got a lot of materials, so I can continue for a long time, but I'd like to wrap up on time because we are already delayed, I think, uh, in this session. Now, uh, this is uh, basically what we talked about, that whenever you are trying to do something smart, you have to do it with your eyes open. You can't do anything smart with your eyes closed. Unfortunately, most of the subsurface works we are doing today, we do it with our eyes closed. We do not know what is underground, we do not know what is already hidden there, and we try to create new infrastructure. And that's where this presentation comes in picture. How can we do things with our eyes open? Very brief, brief introduction to the company which I represent. Parson is a company which is purely in the field of geophysics. We are an ISO certified geophysical company. Uh, we are the largest engineering geophysics company in the country, but more than that, we are known for the innovations we have been making since our inception, including bringing uh, GPI technology in 96, and the list goes on. We work out of Delhi, Kolkata, and the heading, we have the office from where we cater to the Gulf, and Egypt and Sudan, we have agent offices. We have a pretty vast experience of working in India, Singapore, Oman, Afghanistan, Greece, Saudi Arabia, Bahrain, Kuwait, Iran, Algeria, and Georgia. We are trying to add more countries to this, this list as we talk. I'm a geophysicist. I passed out from Rurki in uh, 1990. Uh, I did my MTech from there. I worked briefly with the uh, state government and then the central government, atomic energy. 95 is the time when I left from there and I went to Montreal for some time to bring this technology in the country. And since then I'm just doing this, uh, bringing whatever is best in, in the field of near surface geophysics to solve the problems of subsurface in the country. So with this brief introduction, we come to the topic. So what is a smart city? Frankly speaking, uh, we discussed part of it in the inaugural function, and there is no universally accepted definition of a smart city. In a country like India, in the imagination of any person who lives in a city, the picture of a smart city contains a wish list of infrastructure and services that describes his or her level of aspiration. For that matter, like if I'm living in a small town, getting a 24-hour electricity supply itself makes my city very smart. Having 24-7 Water, for example, will make my city very smart. For a developed country, they will need for much, much more things than just water and electricity. So a smart city is a city that provides core infrastructure and gives a decent quality of life to its citizens, clean and sustainable environment, and application of smart solutions. That is how we start with smart cities definition. Then we come to basic infrastructure. Assured water and electricity supply, sanitation and solid waste management, efficient urban mobility and public transport, robust IT connectivity, e-governance and citizen participation, safety and security of citizens, constitute core infrastructure elements of a smart city. Application of smart solutions is essence of a smart city concepts. A smart solutions. Then we come to my topic, that's underground infrastructure. Underground infrastructure constitutes a major component of any city's infrastructure with underground metro corridors, parking, utilities, that is water, gas, sewer, telecom, electricity, etc. Underground infrastructure also remains one of the most neglected, unplanned, least regulated, and rarely maintained components. We all agree to that. Hidden under layers of smooth roads, swanky buildings, lush green parks, and city's exterior, it fails to get the attention, accident, like Dr. Saroop was talking about, pipe ruptures, sunk roads, etc., bring it back to focus. I'll wait for a short time, unfortunately, for a very short time. We again tend to forget that. A smart city cannot be expected to function smartly without paying adequate attention to underground infrastructure. It is of utmost importance to have geospatial database of underground infrastructure to evolve a system of maintenance and updating of this database regularly. Again, what Dr. Saroop was talking about, when we are laying the new pipelines, how we should incorporate the data and incorporate in the database. Otherwise, you create a database today, world-class database today, 
one year down the line, it's already outdated, unless you're updating it. And But where is that system? So that is a system which has to be created if you want smart cities. And coordinate efforts of various stakeholders for smart utilization of underground space. Underground space has to get the same kind of value as we give to the land cost, which is above ground. Today, this is how our underground space looks like. You can cut it open in any other city and you can find this, what you can shortly call a mess. These are all pictures of our own infrastructure from Delhi. But you go to any city and you find the same situation. Now the problem is that the footprint of any new construction, repair or remediation often conflict with existing infrastructure. That is where the problem starts. Whatever you are going in, doing in a city, making a, a, even a simple flyover, you are going to put your piers there, making a parking lot, underground parking lot or putting a new pipeline. The footprint of new construction is going to conflict with what, or, what is there. And if you do not know about it, this hidden or buried infrastructure often will be detected in the construction phase. Once you have done the planning, you have done the design, you have made the drawings, you are there for the construction, your machinery is there, your tools are there, your people are there, and then suddenly you get what you call surprise. A good engineer or good geophysicist should not accept the word surprise. <coughs> surprise is something about which we did not have the information. We did not have the information because we could not get the information because I think we did not try hard enough to get the information. So elimination of surprise is essential if we really want to have smart solutions. Because cost of conflict resolution and potential for catastrophic damages are highest when it is detected at the construction stage. Now, coming to the question why. Why is, is it like this? Why don't we have these drawings? Why don't we have this data? See, we keep adding and changing utilities for expansion, for modernization, for changing utility technologies, or for changing facility missions. But, we don't keep good records. No one can disagree with me on this. Our records are not referenced to change topo features. For example, we had a pipeline on the left side of the road, then the road was widened, the left side became center of the road. Has the drawing changed? Was the drawing given the new dimension there? That's the problem. No centralized record storage. We do not have a single agency <coughs> to take care of all the underground data belonging to any owner. That's completely missing. No standard format. You can find drawings in different scales, different formats of different utility owners. No responsibility. Biggest point. Who is answerable or responsible if an underground utility is damaged or an accident happens? No one is a short answer. And no patient. Today we can create the best to the database. As I said, in Delhi there was a mission where we made a we tried to make a database of all the underground and above ground utilities, Delhi Geospatial Data Management something. What is what about updation? It was done maybe three years back or four years back. Today it's already obsolete because we have not updated the record. So no updation. Now where we get this utility uh, information mostly traditionally? From project plans as designed, from project plans redline, utility record records as designed, utility records as built. This is all theoretical, right? Because as built, 90% is replica of as designed. No one dare give a good as built to the project owner because if as, as built is deviating from as designed, he is going to lose his money by penalty. So generally, as built is a replica of as designed. Maintenance records, repair records, if they exist, and then visual observation and field surveys. As a result, the engineer uses these sources to compile a utility composite that overlays the new design. And the biggest problem is, since the time we have got beautiful CAD and GIS systems where we can digitize the data, that's where the problem has started even more than what it, it always was. See, imagine, you are holding an ammonia print in your hand, all right? My presentation is uh, behaving a little funny. Anyway, you are holding ammonia print in your hand. The road is shown by two lines, two millimeter, millimeter separate, right? And that represents, let's say, 20 meters of road width. And then with a thick tip of a sketch pen, someone has marked a line on this ammonia print saying that this is my water line. Once you have that drawing, you have no confusion that this is just an indicated schematic showing that on this road somewhere there is a water line. Because the, the thickness of the pen is 1.5 mm, and the entire 20 meter road is 2 mm. So no engineer will ever take that record 
as a record which is showing the location of the pipeline. But what happens now? The entire record is digitized. It goes to a CAD operator. He digitizes this load thickness, give it a width of 20 meters, and now it is up to his imagination where he will put this water line. He can put it on the left, or the right, or the center. It's up to his imagination. The information does not exist, but he has to make a drawing. So he makes a drawing, and now this beautiful computer drawing comes to you. And since it's computerized, it looks very beautiful. There is no reason why you will not trust it. There, the pipeline is shown one meter from the left edge of the road. You take that as the authentic data and you start building your entire design or planning based on that. Information has got created which was not there. And that's not information. Misinformation has got created which never existed there. That is the biggest problem we are facing. Any map, any of the project engineers or owners sitting here, have you received any map ever in your life? This says that confidence level on this map is 100%, 50%, 25% or 10%? The short answer is no. Our maps never define what confidence level you can have on, have on them. That is the biggest problem. So it creates misinformation. So what happens with this misinformation? Engineer ends up with utility data of unknown reliability and discussion like this takes place. I think the gas line is here, but I am not really sure. It might be in conflict with the proposed piling. The other guy says, I guess we will let the contractor worry about that. It's not our responsibility. And then accidents do happen. In our country, we have had accidents. We have had collapse of flyover because of sewer line, who was right under a pier, etc., etc. So we all are aware of that. And that is how it happens. So this makes it difficult, extremely difficult to manage the risks that are created by existing underground utilities. So to putting all these problems together, one, there is no central repository of location of underground utilities. I broke the pencil, I'm sorry. No single agency monitoring the laying of new utilities, non-availability of as-built drawings, the honest as-built drawings, and covering of manholes and inspection covers during laying of roads. People working in all the cities, especially Delhi, are aware of it. We do not get manholes anymore. We have been, actually it's a business. So now sometimes we get a lot of orders to find out buried manholes, which have been buried by new layers of roads. These are the big problems we are facing. Now with these problems, with this level of information, all misinformation, can we think about a smart decision maker, making smart choices and smart decisions to build smart cities? So we need, why we need these smart solutions is that we don't know where most utilities are, existing records are often inaccurate, incomplete, and risks become extremely difficult to manage, and the risk list is there, project delays, damage to utilities, safety of workers, safety of public, redesign costs, change orders, back publicity. All these are the risks which we are dealing with if we do not have adequate information. So what is the solution? Thankfully there is a solution. Technology is a the solution. There are new technologies for solutions. That is surface geophysics, surveying techniques, CAT, GIS, minimally intrusive excavation, all put together and it comes and makes a discipline which we call subsurface utility engineering. It's actually a discipline. In other countries, you can find engineers who are certified as SUE engineers. In India also, we will definitely try to do that in association with IMDSCT. But this is a solution. So here, it establishes a credible nomenclature system to fix attributes to utility information to denote quality of utility information. What does this mean? Is that when a map comes to you, on the map, every utility has a quality level attribute attached to it, by which you can make out, I can trust this 100%, it might be accurate only in location or not very accurate in depth or this is just a representation of some line in this area. I cannot trust it for my final design or final construction. This is the kind of quality attribute that comes to you. I'll just discuss that in detail. So the standard has been made on this which deals with how this information is obtained, what technologies are available for finding this information and how this information should be conveyed to the people who are actually doing the work on the ground. The so intent of this entire thing is to reduce risk by improving the reliability of information on existing subsurface utilities in a defined manner. And actually making a person or a process answerable and responsible for the data which he or process is delivering. So, very briefly, because I have got certain other things also to cover, so I am not going to keep this entire presentation on SUE, but very briefly, what it does is, it gives quality level to your data. 
quality level D is the least reliable data, quality level C is next level, B is the next and A is the next. Quality level A for B is for example based on existing records only. You collect data from all different agencies and you make a map of existing utilities, that's your quality level B. It writes very clearly, it's quality level D. So if you want a very initial preparation of a project, pre-feasibility study and all that, you don't have to spend really money on, on you know, doing the actual survey to find out where the utilities are. You can do this based on this quality level D data, but you know very well that this data is not something which you can consider for construction things. Then comes quality level C. You send people in the field, they pick up things like manholes and all that, and correct this map with surface apprentices becomes quality level C. Quality level B is where the, the real improvement is. The latest geophysical techniques are used to find out already existing buried utilities. And quality level A is a guarantee in 3D, because any indirect technique, it's just like medical imaging. Sometimes it cannot give you 100%. So you go to quality level A, where you actually, with minimal enthusiasm, find out the utility. We'll discuss this one by one. Now this is not a, not a dream, not an imagination. This already is a, a, a code, a standard, by American Society of Civil Engineers, who have made the standard guidelines for collection and depiction of existing subsurface field data. I'm very proud to say that we were the first people to bring it in, in the country. Morning, there was a discussion on Reliance 4G project. Reliance 4G, the entire work of trenchless is being done after a proper SUV service, survey in the entire country. And we have obviously done it on a number of places. But the unique nature of utility and record keeping in India obviously made us make, make some changes in these standards which we have done and the stand rights. So four quality levels, D, C, B, A. Going from D is, is the lowest, A is the highest in quality. So D is record research, recollection, and as build drawings. Look at the word recollection there. Sometimes you don't have any record in, in a particular area, but you go and you talk to a very old shopkeeper who is sitting there for the last 30 years of his life, and you ask him, can you tell, tell me something about the utilities? He'll say, yeah, I remember. There was a cable buried here, two meters down. There was a pipe buried there, three meters down. Is that not data? Is that not information? That is information, of course. But we did not have any formal way of recording the information. SUE system provides you a, a way to, fight, to record that information and put that in quality level D. C, you take your DGPS total station, map the manholes, map the water apprentices, junction box, etc., etc. Correlate the data which you had gathered from records, put it now in the correct position, it becomes a quality level C data. Why still C? Why it's not final? Because even after doing that, you do not have depth of the utilities. Even after doing this, you do not know whether the UPT is straight between one apprentice to the other, so it's still quality level C. Good enough for feasibility studies, not good enough for final designs and construction. Then quality level B. As I said, this is where the real improvement is. There are various tools, ground penetrating radar, induction locators, magnetic locators, actually the list goes on which can be used to detect the presence of and the location of underground utilities. This, this example is ground penetrating radar, which is working on, on the system of sending EM waves. And this is induction locator. This one is induction locator. This is again a, a ground penetrating radar, a different model. This example is Indian example, as we can see from the, <coughs> I don't need to say how we can see that, but I think it's very clear, it's an Indian example. And this is a, obviously from out of country. And this is how, for example, your underground buried pipes look like. Okay, these are pipes. These are location and this is the depth. This is how underground foundation looks like. So with this, it's not about only metallic. Metallic, non-metallic, all kind of pipes, cables, buried foundations, buried obstructions, you can find out using this technology. And then, so this quality level B has made it very good to go up to the construction planning. But sometimes, it can be very critical to find out even condition of underground utility, the material of the underground utility. What is the stage of, of a corrosion, for example? There you have to go for physical inspection. And that's where vacuum excavation comes in picture. They just make a hole, some six inches by six inches, and by vacuum exca excavation, you open up and inspect the utility in detail. Quality level A data can also be obtained from existing chambers and uh, openings like manholes. So this is one example of how it is being done. Support is for you pre checking. And you open it, you see a power cable, freshwater pipeline, open chamber, and that's how you get the quality level A data. 
A is based on absolutely looking at the utility. This is how, for example, a typical GPI data looks like. This is a pipe here. This is a, a slab frame, okay? A slab or a, a flat interface, basically. It can be a box drain or a slab. And this axis is depth. Here you can see it's depth in meters, and this is distance. So once you do this on, on a road or, or any place, you're able to see these different pipes and cables which are there. Ultimately, intent is to give something like this to the owner. This, for example, shows all the utilities in a, in a five meter corridor, OFC, OFC, water, sewer, whatever it is. And here they write QLB, 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 etc. Now what it means is, that you are telling the project owner how much you can trust this data. If you write QLB, it means it has been actually detected directly by geophysical methods. Right? So it's very reliable data. If it would have said QLD, it means project owner would have decided that this data is least trusted because I can only trust it based on the old records. So that is the importance of SUV process that finally the map which you are getting clearly is telling you how much can you trust me. Imagine having some system where it can be on our, our forehead that you know if a person meets us and that new person and we know that how much we can trust him. But this map exactly does that for the utilities. Now with this small introduction to SUV, how much time do I have? 10 minutes? 5? Alright. Okay. I requested him actually to give me alarm before 5 minutes. So. Alright. So now I'll, I'll just briefly go for other uh, techniques or methods which are important to find out what is underground other than utilities. Utilities is one part of it. But when you are working on an underground project, you want to find out where is your bedrock level, you want to find out what is the thickness of overburden, you want to find out if there are any cavities or boulders inside, you want to find out so many things, like people have worked in metro and other projects, they all already know about it. So there we have these geophysical solutions, where, of course these images are medical images, right? We all know that. It's an ultrasound, and it's an x-ray, and CT scan, and MRI. Idea is to create similar images of subsurface, like this. So these are now geophysical images. Here, for example, you have a fracture zone in a hard rock. These are reinforcement bars in concrete. This is bottom of the concrete. These are buried pipes. These are cavity in sandstone, and this is fractures in a dam, concrete dam. So we try to create the similar images with a great limitation that medical imaging, imaging everything is available in 360 degrees. And we know what a normal human looks like. In geophysics, we have only one surface available, that is top of the earth, and there is nothing called a normal earth. Earth changes from one place to the other. From Lodi Road to Nehru Place, it will change. Right? So that's the challenge we face. But it's important, SNI is very, very important, because quality of investigation, quantity of investigation, and time make sure that you have less uncertainties and less cost and claims. So there are various methods for that, since the time is Less, I will not go in detail, just show you few glimpses. This is, for example, one matter of seismic refraction tomography, which gives you a continuous detailed profile of your bedrock. And what is the quality of bedrock? Even for choosing a right tool, I was recently in a conference with uh, Mr. Jitendra Tyagi of uh, DMRC, and he was talking of certain cases of DMRC tunneling, when they they encountered rock when they didn't expect it, right? This is the kind of uncertainty it removes. When you know what is the quality of rock, you can choose the right tool. You know what is the topography. For example, here is the topography of the rock. You can see how it is going. It is impossible to get this kind of information for any number of drilling. Here, rock is going like this and there is a dip in the rock here, again here. A shear zone in the rock. This kind of information can never come from any kind of invasive investigation. And you can make a 3D contour plan of the rock. Then we have methods like electrical ray to imaging, which is very good to find out cavities and boulders underground. Many projects in Mumbai recently we encountered that because of presence of boulders, they got stuck in, in one project. So this is something which you can find out your boulders and cavities. It also can be done across rivers. There are a lot of pipeline crossing which are being done across the rivers and we want to find out what is the sediment thickness and what is the bedrock level across the flowing river and doing a drilling there is very time consuming and very costly. Whereas with this investigation, you can do up to two to three river crossings in a single day. Single day, two to three river crossings. And till date, we have done more than 80. This is something which we have kind of, we, we add to our innovation which we have done in the country. We have a lot of case studies on this. 
and you get information like this. This, this is all water, and this is the expected bedrock level. This is from Nepal, one project. Here is the bedrock, and this is the water. Imagine doing two to three of these crossings per day, very simply. I'll skip uh, other parts of it because uh, these are. Once you have made a project, you can also find out the condition of this project. For example, and even in the existing project, let's say you have a concrete, this is a tunnel. Where a tunnel was there, it was leaking, so they wanted to find out where are these zones from there this water is coming. So this all can be done, and these are the zones, for example, where the water is coming from. You can see these zones. This is a, a facility where they wanted to find out what is the condition of reinforcement bars because of the seawater. This is in Bahrain. It's our operation in Bahrain. And here a crack was developed in the concrete wall, and we wanted to see what is the condition of reinforcement bars. And you can see something like this. These are the reinforcement bars. It's almost opening the ground and telling you exactly how it is looking inside. And of course, having a 3D map of that, showing you the areas of deterioration. This is another project in which cavities behind the channel walls, concrete walls, were done using GPR. So, any possibilities are unlimited. Even difficult leaks, if anyone sitting from Delhi Jal Board and things like this, difficult leaks, which where you don't have any access to the pipeline. This is from Delhi Airport T3, and it can be found out using GPR and seismic methods. And of course, the entire thing now with the data processing capabilities is presented in a kind of way which anyone can understand. This is a 3D cube of a 60 meter wide, 300 meter long, and 60 meter deep ground, where the objective was to find this cavity, which you see here. This is all water table. Here is the water table. This was the cavity. It was very important to find this cavity because a pier of a bridge was coming right over this place. When they were doing the drilling, the drill bit went down by 60 centimeter, and that alarmed them. Right? Thank God it went down 60 centimeters because after the bridge was constructed, finding this cavity would have been actually a catastrophe. So this kind of uh, results uh, presentation is possible thanks to the technology and the more computer power which we have got now. With this, I would like to conclude this presentation on this, the, uh, the note that smart cities need smart solutions and a fresh relook at the way underground space is utilized and managed. The first step towards this would be to know the situation as of now. Various geophysical techniques exist to provide continuous information of subsurface conditions in totally non-destructive manner to accurately plan activities in project. There is an urgent need to institutionalize mapping and updating records of underground utilities before we embark on our journey towards creating smart cities. I would really love to have this as one of the recommendations of this conference. Actually, you cannot think or imagine having smart cities without knowing what's already underground and then having a system to update that. There are different departments doing different things. It doesn't work like that. And geophysical techniques offer most economical methods to achieve this goal. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, and now what is given does not have this presentation because this has come late to me. And uh, what we can do is we will be taking a PDF copy of this presentation that will be available uh, with me. I can't post it on my website because, because of the size. I request all of you to communicate to me so that we can send it by email or something. This is, this is not printed in the uh, hand, handouts. Thank you, Dr. Tana. Now I request uh, Dr. Mr. Ashkosh Bhattwaj to kindly give a presentation on CADC when the database. This is a question. One second. Yes, sir. I am from the Water Investment Geophysical uh, methods is mostly limited to accurately locating the pipeline, finding the depth, etc. Right? 
we really do not go beyond that because we do not have very uh, what you call foolproof uh, models available linking this data because ultimately we are amazing physical things. Linking this with the condition, it is not there. For condition assessment, you have things like CCTV cameras which you are putting inside the pipeline, okay, smoke test, dye test, etc. I have a separate presentation on that. In fact, we can share it sometime. But geophysical methods per se, very limited, like corrosion for example. Right? The level of corrosion, etc. or failure of, of the anti-corrosion mechanism, these are some, something which you can do with the potential methods, but we do not stretch it beyond that. But till like, uh, well, broadly speaking, uh, metallic, non-metallic classification is possible, okay, and classification of diameter is possible, not determination of diameter. What, when I say that, what I mean is, for example, we did a project in Tirupur, long time back, I did 98, 99. So, if you have a, what, three different diameters of pipelines, based on the data you can categorize, that this is this, this is this, this is this. If you start calculating what is the diameter, you are getting into a domain where unknown parameters are much more than the variables are much more than the parameter solution parameters you have. So you get into unstable equations. So people claim that, but a good technical geophysicist will never claim that because that's not correct. What he is talking about, for example, like uh, there was one, one workshop which I conducted on, on pipeline leakage, smart ball solution, for example, right? If smart balls are there, you just leave it with a flow, it goes from pipeline to pipeline. Pigs are there. So, but these are obviously not part of the geophysical part of it, right? But there are certain solutions like that. Now, they can be expensive or maybe they are not available in India as of now. What? They called Sahara in the US. They are providing these solutions. Yeah. What is the problem in smart city is that the smaller size of pipes. Can you do these than 200 mm and less pipes? You can't do. There are technologies available in US, Israel and all. But these are not come to India or no cost effective solution like this geophysics have been well developed now in India. Most of these cities are being done with that. That is what is required. No, you need a ballpark figure. When I need to replace out of this 800 kilometers of pipeline, how much I take a call for replacement due to encrustation, due to corrosion? Can I know the diameter so that I can design the DMAs in a proper manner? You can't do NRW if you don't know the diameters of the pipes or the, you know, where the looping is being done. You know, these are simple facts. Thank you, Dr. Rana. No, that's, uh, that's what, what he, he said. If you go through the process of SUV, as we discussed, right? After quality level B, we were going to quality level A. That particular quality level has been added basically for this purpose only. But there again, you have to cut open, right? You have to cut open to see the size, the, the condition, etc. And obviously take it as representative of the remaining section, right? But that that is, is what is being done, sir. Yeah. We do. We have right. done for 8 or 10 cities in Tamil Nadu. Right. All the smart cities, we have only done it. The problem, all the distribution part of it, but the problem is you don't have that time here. In, in smart cities, you have to give your ROI within five years. Your implementation time will you almost take two to three years time. We need a quick methodology of, you have done so much of algorithm and things like that. Even if a ballpark figure, right? My company is doing two cities now in the northern part of the country. We want to do a quick, like what you said, no, quick asset mapping and you know the first level that A level or in between A and C level. We want to know the ballpark figure to go over what you call that a, a plan to the investors saying that World Bank or whoever is it, this is what your DPI said, this is what could be a capital replacement program and justify it properly. Today there is no yardstick in this country. All the projects in water are failing because what is perceived by the contractor when he quotes and what he actually sees in the field exponential difference so it all stops all the operator contracts are stop only due to this i'll just uh, quickly add uh, one thing to what you said i totally agree with you that's number one number two is the smart way to going about is first, first of all to map the complete assets where they are which ultimately is not available so any estimate really is not accurate 
once you have done that, with this you can classify the different kind of pipes, materials and classification of diameter as I said. Okay. Then opening up smartly, very few inspection holes, rather than just opening up anywhere and not finding it, so opening it somewhere else. Hey, you know exactly where it is, what's the classification, just open it and the, this vacuum excavation technology which I talked about can open this 6 inch by 6 inch hole and cover it back in a matter of around 1 hour or 1 and a half hours. It's not like doing trenching by hand and things like this. So this is the way. We can obviously discuss it offline also. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Anand. Now I request Ms. Bhattwai, so I need to go.